Just as every journey begins somewhere, it must inevitably come to an end. Life is something we sometimes take for granted. We are here, and in the moment of existing, it's hard to imagine the alternative. In fact, the mystery of non-existence has plagued humanity since we became cognitively aware of our mortality. So much so, that we've built extended mythology trying to explain and understand something we can never truly understand in life. In fact, we are so incapable of fathoming our non-existence that many of us believe in some part of our essence that continues on even after we die. We call it the afterlife. That there is some separate part of ourselves that we call a soul, and our memories continue on in this mystical, unknowable realm, by whatever name we call it. Death cannot be the end, we say. There must be more. And so, we have this cultural expectation that death does not destroy us, but simply moves us into a new part of our existence. That death is not the end of us, but merely one form we've taken, and now it's time to move on to another. That is the core of the death card in the Major Arcana of the Tarot, the subject of today's Symbolism and Lore. First things first, if you're not familiar with the tarot deck and some of the basics of how it works, I give a brief breakdown in the first symbolism and lore linked in the title card in the upper right hand corner of the screen and in the description below. Up to speed? Excellent! When most people think of the tarot cards, usually it's in the context of Hollywood digging up every trope created during the Satanism scare of the 80s and 90s to sell us on how spooky and scary their supernatural baddie really is. They pull out the fortune teller who gasps at how dark the fate of their patron is, and they show the cards, but only the scary ones of course, cards like the hanged man, or the devil, or naturally death itself. I mentioned it before, but one of the reasons I'm tackling some of these cards is because they often don't mean what you think they'd mean. They are rarely as scary as Hollywood would have you believe. Most everything has a neutral event or energy represented. It ultimately comes down to the interpretation of the reader, and as I said before, every card in the reading influences the energy of even the most intense cards. That said, some cards do have a more intense energy to them, and yes, those cards are among them. They are cards of turbulence, of upset, of change. And the thing is, death is just not something we can address casually. And it shouldn't be. Regardless of whether we see it as a permanent end, or merely a passage into another stage of our existence, it marks a departure of one kind or another. It marks a full transformation from one state of being into another. Let's take a look at the actual card. One of the most prominent features in any depiction of the death card is usually the big honking skeleton, often with the giant harvesting scythe that we associate with the Grim Reaper, aka the incarnation of death. The scythe is notably absent in the Rider Waite deck, and instead, Death holds a banner featuring a white flower. In many instances, Death rides a horse, most often a white horse. I have personally seen multiple instances of Death being clad in red or marked with red, a vivid, intense color that catches the attention. There's a lot to pull apart here, so I'm going to start with the most obvious thing. Death as represented by a skeleton. How do you represent the very concept of Death? Well. A skeleton is very recognizable, even without the flesh encasing it. A skeleton is very clearly human. And yet, without our flesh, we are not alive. We understand on an instinctual level that when we see a skeleton, that person is most certainly not alive anymore. It goes further than that even. When someone is deathly ill and has been literally wasting as a result of illness or starvation, the fact that we can see the skeleton underneath is an unsettling sign of how close to death someone may actually be. We know, on sight, 
that the bones are not meant to be seen. Well, except teeth, but I mean, that's how we're built. Those are supposed to be showing. The rims of our eye sockets, the ribs in our chest, not so much. So when we see a skeleton, the connection with death is already there. We know this being is not alive. The joys of the flesh can no longer be enjoyed. All that is left is the former core of what was once alive. And this can set us on edge immediately. Reminders of our mortality are always uncomfortable. Even if a skeleton isn't a direct threat to us, we still get wary to see one. I mean, have you ever been in a biology classroom where they had a skeleton on display and been creeped out as its empty sockets stared at you? Endlessly stared, peerless and soul-crushing, they see you, and the end of your days they know- The scythe is really fascinating in how we've integrated it into our collective unconscious as a symbol of death. We invented the tool as part of a very life-affirming activity, reaping the harvest. Harvest in itself is all about plenty and excess. It's about thriving, the most bountiful time, the happiest celebrations, the time to kick back and enjoy what we have worked so hard to gain. And yet, we have connected this tool with death, with an entity who indiscriminately takes from us. I mean, obviously, it's a giant blade, one that would be pretty intimidating if someone were to try and wield it against us. Though, I will add, a scythe is generally pretty terrible for combat. Not only is it inefficient, it's unwieldy, and you can easily disarm or parry it, but the fear remains. It just looks sinister, long and curved, slowly reaching behind us, ready to sever our connection to our bodies. The wet flower, when it appears, has a similar meaning to when it appears in The Fool's depiction. Innocence. Purity. And here is a clue that death is not meant to be foreboding or frightening. Death is natural, and has no ill intent. It simply is. And without it, life would remain stagnant, unchanged. Death is as innocent as the fool, and has just as kind of an intention. And red. Oh, red, one of the most eye-catching and vibrant colors, used to symbolize passion courage, or even the very essence of vitality itself. Certainly we use it to indicate caution, warning, or fear, but there's a warmth to the color. Here, death is connected with both interpretations. The transformation of death does not come easily, and can often be painful or even traumatic. It's an intense process, and you will find, coming out the other side, that a lot of what you were before has been burned away by the trial you've undergone. But change is vital to life. We must grow and adapt in order to survive. And that energy is what we see encapsulated in the death card. Death is ubiquitous in popular culture. If I were to give you a rundown on every example of death appearing in the media, we would be here for hours. And while I love your company, believe me, that would get very old for you very quickly. Death has been depicted in somber, sobering dramas, in arthouse films, even in comedy and cartoons. The character of death, as a fictional entity, is versatile and applies to nearly every aspect of our storytelling, in one form or another. In almost every example, again, death appears as a skeleton with their scythe, when it's time to amp up the drama for someone near death, or already having passed, this manifestation of death appears, ready to reap the soul. Sometimes death appears as a warning, highlighting the cold wisdom that, when all the hubbub of life is stripped away, when all the material world has no meaning for us anymore, our deeds and connections are the only things that stay with us when we pass through the veil. So perhaps we should be more mindful of the way we live our lives. Sometimes, death is a joke. This omnipotent, endless incarnation of a concept we can barely fathom, being thwarted by a clever protagonist, or worse, a total idiot. How better to foil such a serious character than with the unexpected? There are far too many examples of death, the character representation of the concept, in media to go over. 
Ah, but what about examples of death as change? It might be easier to convey the meaning of the tarot card that way. One of the first that comes to mind is the classic Silence of the Lambs film, where one of the major themes is transformation. In fact, this is woven directly into the plot as the theme of the antagonist, a serial killer who seeks to transform himself into another form, using what he takes from his victims. He even communicates this through a signature of his, planting a cocoon in the throat of his victims of a rare breed of moth, the Death's Head Hawk Moth. As the name would suggest, this moth has a distinct pattern on its back, one resembling a human skull. It's no coincidence that this rare moth with a skull on its back is used by the killer. He wants to deliberately convey transformation as an element to his killings. Moths and butterflies are themselves another powerful metaphor for transformation, which makes sense given what they go through to get from baby to adult form. An intermediate stage where they become DNA goop inside a shell before reforming, somehow, in the correct and beautiful final shape. But of course, they are distinguished from other moths, and purposefully raised by the killer, because they are marked by a skull. We can find another example of this theme in a considerably less morbid place in Disney's Hercules. Hercules achieves his goal of becoming a true hero the moment he demonstrates a willingness to sacrifice his life to save another. The moment of his death marks a transformation, his ascension to godhood. Though this is almost immediately subverted, he does still change. He becomes just a bit more wise to where his place is in the world. Speaking of people dying to ascend to godhood, there's a ton of that going on in Homestuck. Heck, I'm not even sure why I said this contains spoilers for Homestuck because pretty much everyone dies at least once, and some people multiple times. There's a specific mechanism in death for the main characters, however, where it's necessary in order to ascend to God tier and come fully into power. There is a long, complicated explanation for this mechanism, like everything else in Homestuck, but the heroes really and truly become a different person upon ascending through death. And death is a necessary step in the process, to merge a divided soul into one body. You can see this theme in video games, too. In Arcanum, of Steamworks and Magic Obscura, the game begins with a legend about the reincarnation of an ancient deity being reborn on wings of fire, which you manage to fit the description perfectly thanks to a massive zeppelin crash that the prologue throws you into. There's also a long, optional quest to visit various shrines to the pantheon of gods in the game, and be blessed by each of the gods in turn. If you do it in the right order, the final shrine requires a sacrifice. Your life. You are almost immediately brought back, however, with the ultimate blessing having changed your in-game stats. Or, in the Dragon Age series, there is a ritual to join the Guardian Order of the Grey Wardens, one where you imbibe a magical concoction containing the blood of the main enemy of the game. This concoction changes you on a physical level, and you are lucky to survive the ritual. While not explicit, there is an implication that who you are prior to the ritual dies, and you are reborn as a warden. This process also inexorably blights the Grey Warden until they succumb to a more sinister transformation that happens more gradually. But that's a discussion for another day. Death and Rebirth are a strong theme in the Silent Hill series, with various characters going through massive transformations either while exposed to death or going through it themselves. While the games are massively wrapped in mystery and it's hard to tell what is literal and what is metaphor, you can see it etched into the very nature of the games, especially the ones developed by the original Team Silent that created the game in the first place. Alessa Gillespie seems forever trapped in a cycle of death and rebirth, whether she truly dies or goes through a more symbolic death. Others caught in the curse of her broken world find themselves stuck in their own cycles of death and return, descent and resurfacing. Most blatantly in Silent Hill 4, The Room, the goal of the antagonist is to transform himself and the room that he considers to be his 
mother. Walter commits several atrocities and kills many people in a ritual supposed to resurrect and awaken his mother, including himself. When he dies, he transcends the limitations of his mortal body and is able to complete his mission through his influence in the mysterious dark world blanketing the area. There are many examples in media, and in life, that trying to recount them all would keep you here for hours. Or, uh, have you click off and watch something else, something that probably makes reference to death or transformation, statistically speaking anyway. Death changes us all. Anyone who has lost a close loved one knows the difference between what their life was before that loss and what it became afterwards. It can be a completely different life from what you knew before. Someone, or something, was lost. Maybe through accident, maybe through sacrifice, but what was once here is now gone. And things will be forever changed by that. Life goes on after loss. Sometimes you do the exact same thing you did before. You go to work, and you do the same job, or you go to school and attend lecture as always. The world doesn't stop, but it becomes altered. Everything has a new meaning or significance. Something may have been taken from your life, and you may never be the same, but you have come out the other side and have found a new life waiting. It's normal to grieve what has been lost, but there can be great joy in letting go of what you held onto before, too. For many, the transformation is intentional, deliberate, and what was needed for their freedom. With a blank slate and a new start, they can choose a new direction to move in. So when the death card appears in your reading, it's not your doom. It's not the end. It's not something easy to go through, either, and you will definitely feel the effects of it going through it. But the good news is, there is a tomorrow. And one way or another, you will be guided through the darkness by a mysterious figure, whether you sense them or not. You will not be going through this period alone, even if your circumstances are dire. There is hope. Though it might only look like a tiny white blossom amidst the clinging vines. Before I close out today, I want to thank my patrons over on Patreon for their support. Their names should be on screen right about now, and I really can't thank you guys enough. I can make the content that I love because of you, and that means so much. If you're interested in helping out, even just for a dollar a month, you'll make it into the credits and get early access to every video that goes up on my channel. Thank you all for watching today's video. Death is a heavy subject to tackle, and I sincerely doubt that I'm done talking about it, especially given how prolific its presence is throughout stories of all kinds. Hopefully I can bring you something more uplifting on the next episode of Symbolism and Lore. I hope to see you then.